and it was discovered that Hacking Team, a private enterprise based in Italy, was actually found to be selling their software to countries that were on the blacklist for human rights abuse. So besides the issues of money and the issues of free speech and our privacy, there's also this issue of ethics. My question concerns um, the, the nature of this product, this technology, and they're selling it through fear and they're selling it through greed. And I think those are three very hard motivations that we have to overcome in order to combat this, this dreadful use of technology that we all suffer from. Do you any ideas how we can do this? Thank you. I think as consumers, particularly younger people, are becoming much more savvy about the transaction that is happening every time you use products like Facebook uh, or Google or uh, shiny products from uh, Apple, that if you're getting it for free, then you're the product. Now that's a that's a that's a nice simplification and uh, of a, a very very complex transaction that's going on, but but it's a it's one I think that people are beginning to understand. Um, but it's one that sadly that I think they are still prepared to undertake. A lot of people are still willing to trade their very very valuable. I mean, purely from an economic point of view, their extraordinarily valuable privacy uh, to. Uh, to the world's biggest companies for very, very little other than the opportunity to be advertised at and to share photos. So um, the process whereby there's any sort of reversal of what is a very asymmetric relationship between the world's biggest companies and you and I as consumers, um, I, I think is, you know, if it's, if it's going to happen, it's going to take uh, a very long time. That's the greed aspect of, of the transaction. When you talk about fear, that's the other side of it, what we're being sold on the flip side of it, is the need for us to be placed under surveillance because of, uh, of the threat, particularly of terrorism, um, which, you know, as you know, the, the evidence is simply, I, I think the evidence is just compelling that there is the, tr the purported trade off between privacy slash freedom and uh, security simply doesn't exist. We're not more secure because of uh, rampant surveillance. Uh, and I, talk, I, I touched on that uh, in my speech. Uh, we are not more secure because we have data retention laws here in Australia. We are not more secure because we have the NSA uh, you know, trawling the entire internet looking for data. So this, uh, we were always told that there needs to be a balance between liberty and, uh, and security. Well, A, the balance only ever tips one direction, driven by fear, but secondly, it's not even a trade-off. We're not losing. Any, we're not. We're not gaining anything from our um, uh, from our so-called additional security. As Bernard described in his presentation, how the, you know tremendous amount of money is poured into uh, funding the cyber military industrial complex, and then to me the question is, where did where does this money come from? And you know, I think it's partially it's funded by our tax money. But I also learned to be it's actually uh, given by central banks printing money out of the air, and the corporations basically using these monies with zero in, zero interest rates and funding those corporations who sell these uh, surveillance uh, tools. So I think that we have to really understand how how uh, money um, is being controlled by those in power and the corporations. Uh, as an extension, um, so I, I think that um, you know it's it's not that uh, we ordinary people are funding these surveillance tools, but the corporations are funding it. And uh, uh, if we understand uh, this mechanism, and the, for me the solution really is for us to take back our control over money, and that's really um, the solution for many many issues, not just surveillance. But, but to really abolish even the big state. Okay, next question, please. Hi, I'm Wynne. I'm from the Politics and the Pub Committee. Thank you both very much. My question is, what difference would it make if we just take Australia as an example, if all this vast amount of money that ultimately us, the taxpayer, is paying, what difference could it, would it make to the proper funding of the essential services of public education, public health, 
etc., etc. I mean, in other words, how much is this actually draining, draining our money away from what government should be doing as far as using our tax dollar to actually provide good services for its people? We are talking about billions of dollars of money that is being spent on, uh, on intelligence, domestic intelligence, foreign intelligence, military uh, intelligence. The thing to remember about, about when you talk about military budgets though, and this is particularly true in the United States, but it's certainly true in every Western country, you've got to remember that, uh, also in the case of Australia, we spent $31 billion this year on, uh, on blowing stuff up, basically. The thing to remember is that military policy is importantly understood as a tool of industry policy. Because every Western country, but particularly the United States, uses its military budget as an arm of economic policy in order to uh, prop up its manufacturing base, in order to employ uh, uh, large numbers of manufacturing workers in usually in politically sensitive uh, areas. Um, and this is a, this is a long-running tradition in the United States. It is a massive export industry. In the United States, France and Great Britain are massive arms exporters. They make a lot of money from selling arms. And, uh, to a much smaller extent that applies in Australia as well. We have an industry, we have a defence policy that is partly industry policy as well. So if you think about the military budget as being a direct kind of, you know, drawing off, siphoning off of money that's available for uh, education and health, well it is, but it's also providing manufacturing jobs, it's also operating as a kind of a, a protectionist mechanism for, uh, for the Australian manufacturing sector. So. It needs to kind of be borne in mind that um, that you know, this is this is not a kind of zero sum game between different elements uh, of the budget. But look, it it, all, it always comes back down to what is the actual benefit we are getting from surveillance? Well, we are giving security bureaucrats um, a great sense of control. Um, we're giving security bureaucrats all you know far more tools than they actually need. There are laws on the books uh, in relation to, for example, what's called data preservation, which is data retention in all but name that was passed in 2012, that ASIO has never actually used because they haven't needed to. So they actually have so much power, they don't know what to do with it. Um, but we can continue giving them more power uh, and, uh, and more money. So, I mean, the, the, we come back to well, what is the benefit of the transaction here? Well, there's actually very, very little benefit in terms of, of additional security. Uh, from the massive amount of money that we're spending on intelligence. Of course, if you're an American corporation or an Australian corporation, you're benefiting from the commercial espionage that is being undertaken by the Australian Signals Directorate or the National Security Agency or the many other agencies that are involved in mass surveillance, then you're probably doing very well from that as well. But for the average citizen, the benefits uh, are very, very limited. And from their point of view, um, yeah, there is actually a substantial disbenefit from the massive amount of money that we spend uh, on intelligence and um, uh, compared to what could be directed toward education and health. I'm not saying ditch the military by any stretch of the imagination. And in fact, there is a strong argument that if you want a more independent foreign policy for Australia, then you have to back the idea that we need to spend more money on defence because we can't rely on the United States to provide a security guarantee. That's an entirely different debate. But nonetheless, um, you know, the, the fact that we are spending so much money on intelligence, gathering, surveillance, uh, and the military-related applications of that uh, mean, you know, does have significant implications for the amount of money we can direct uh, to other areas that uh, might be as, every bit as economically beneficial as you know, uh, you know, finding out what Indonesian trade negotiators are saying uh, about their trade dispute with the United States. The hacking industry, hacking industry. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent is it, is, does it behave, is it legal, does it behave legally and illegally? Is it, um, you know, could imagine that uh, there'd be tremendous competitive pressures just to ignore the rules and be as effective as possible. On the other hand, you've got to deal with the judicial system, the US government and so on. Um, is it essentially part of a black economy and does whatever it needs to do in order to achieve its ends? The Stratford case uh, that involves the uh, whistleblower, Jeremy Hammond, for example, is a good case that you know the U.S. government framed him as uh, a hacker, you know, as uh, not as a as a whistleblower, but um, somebody who basically um, uh, break the law, for instance. 
So, you know, US government, for instance, has a very good way of deciding uh, what is legal and what is illegal when it comes to hacking. So, um, another example, of course, is uh, anonymous, online collective anonymous. Whenever um, they, you know, hack uh, 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 the large corporations like Sony, for instance, of course, again, the US government treats it as, uh, as a terrorism. Uh, so, um, um, I think that the you know, United States has the CIA recruit people with skills, with hacking skills, to uh, work for them. And I think that there is an industry, there is a money pouring into to support this operation. Um, but um, I don't know exactly how much money, what amount, uh, how, how much degree as to uh, this, is, this has become a black, black market industry. But um, I know that the U.S. government is supporting um, hackers and uh, deciding uh, who, what activities are legal, what is, what are not illegal. So um, um, it's you know to answer your question, um, it's it's you know to to define what is legal and what is illegal it is you know we kind of live in live in a lawless lawless society where those in power can dis define what law is. So, um, yeah. Uh, of course, when it comes to uh, state-level hacking, uh, the Patriot Act uh, expired uh, in June of this year, and the Second District Court of Appeal um, decided that, uh, that mass surveillance was never included as permissible within the Patriot Act, and uh, it was supposed to be changed or else uh, just cancelled. So it's a question of interpretation. My question is with regard to the question of my previous colleague about fear and ignorance. In the industry of finance, fear and ignorance normally breed stupidity. And I'm trying to look for a stupid chink in the armor of this very formidable opponent. And one chink I see is their threat of a kill switch on the internet. So the following questions would be, do you think a kill switch does exist? Second, who will the kill switch harm more, them or us? And if they do threaten us through the kill switch and do turn the whole internet off, what do we do next? We've seen a kill switch in action in, um, in Egypt uh, several yeah. years ago yeah. when, when uh, the whole Egyptian internet was turned off by um, uh, uh, Hosni Mubarak and really the, it redounded on him very, very badly. Um, and what people were able to do was use, uh, use some very old technologies like ham radio um, to, uh, to uh, contact the outside world and, and simply to use dial-up, uh, good old dial-up. Uh, internet uh, with some help from the outside. So I guess what the the, the, the use of a kill switch in that context by a dictator feeling very, very threatened um, uh, was, was not very successful. Um, Australia has an internet kill switch. Uh, it's not actually a device. It's a piece of legislation that gives the government the power to order uh, telecommunications companies to do certain things in emergency situations. Now, uh, I can't actually foresee a circumstance where that power would ever be used because it would be so politically fraught that um, that its use would, um, in anything but most extreme circumstances, would be um, uh, would be very significant. I, look, the, the problem with an internet kill switch is that the internet is fast becoming the surveillance tool of choice of governments. Why would you turn off your surveillance tool of choice? Um, so uh, it, 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 it's it's this is this is. This is the battle, this is the core battle that we're engaged in. The internet is a marvelous tool of democratization. It allows us to connect up with people uh, around the world. It is an enormously liberating, powerful force that means that for the first time in human history, we are able to connect up with anyone we want rather than uh, as for the great majority of human history, we've only been able to connect up with our families, the people that live near us and the people that we work with. So we're free from the tyranny of geography by the internet. And that is enormously liberating. But as we've seen over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, uh, it is potentially also enormously shackling and imprisoning 
because the internet can be used as an astonishingly successful surveillance tool of the kind that leaves former Stasi officers from East Germany uh, really drooling with, uh, well, with jealousy about its capacity. And this is the core battle between the extent to which the internet can be a force of liberation and the extent to which it can be a force of surveillance uh, and control. And uh, in that context, neither side really wants a kill switch. Both of them want to actually win the battle. Um, and that's, that's really the key question. Sometimes I'm very optimistic about, um, about the possibility of, of the, the, the internet providing a, a mechanism for liberation. Most of the time I'm actually very pessimistic and I'm increasingly pessimistic because, um, because of what we've learned over the last couple of years. But that, that kind of feeling of pessimism, that kind of feeling of being overwhelmed by the apparent dominance of the forces of, you know, the forces of darkness when it comes to surveillance, I think is something we've got to resist because if we give up to that feeling, then that, that's, that's, that's victory for them. Does that mean you have something? Yeah, um, yeah I must agree with, uh, with Bernard. Um, the, I don't see any reason that the state um, would uh, um, shut down the internet because the internet is a great tool for control for them. And also the whole entire economy now on the, it's on the internet. So the, the over 80% of money is now digital. So to shut down the internet would mean the complete shutdown of the economy. So I don't think that any reason that, that they would do so. Um, and also the United States control the fiber optic cables uh, of countries like uh, Brazil, for instance. And, and in response to that, uh, Brazil is, is, has been working on to create alternative internet free from US surveillance and uh, censorship. So uh, um, yeah, I don't see any reason that uh, the state would shut down the internet. My question was specifically for you, Dr. Nozomi, what you said about um, how part of the solution is for us to reclaim our money. Um, yes. I just want to know what that would look like in practice. Is that something that should occur over the internet like Bitcoin or away from that through like local currencies in Britain that have been set up? And also, is there not a threat that those any alternative currencies would end up being reinstitutionalized again over time? The invention of the blockchain technology and Bitcoin as uh, its first application as currency has a great um, potential in terms of uh, it will create basically a state-based currency that is independent from central banks and corporations at the global scale. So I think that the, you know, the efforts to create local currencies are, is very important. But at the same time, in terms of scaling, it has a problem and also uh, right now, the, the economy is global, and we live in a global society. So I think that uh, cryptocurrencies such as Bitcoin would be a good, good, um, good tool. And it doesn't have to be Bitcoin. It could be any, any, um, any currency with uh, unique uh, economic, economic policies uh, of our choice and, and of our community's choice. Um, and just Bitcoin is just an example. And, um, and then right now, the, of course, right now, the banking industries and Goldman Sachs and investment bank, banks are uh, interested in uh, blockchain technology because they see tremendous potential to reduce costs and also to control us, and to recapitulate this existing form of capitalism. So um, the, as I see it, right now, the battle is happening on the blockchain. Who, who could claim the blockchain? Is it going to be that the future of money will be uh, centralized? Or would that be decentralized? And I think that um, just as we need to fight for free internet, we need to fight for free money, decentralized money. Um, and uh, and what's good things about Bitcoin, if you truly understand its potential and the core technology, it is inherently peer-to-peer -peer, uh, uh, technology, and it's it, it's not owned by anyone, uh, no no individuals, no corporations behind it, and uh, so. Uh, there, there would not be any um, possibility to be co-opted, um, but it's just that um, it depends on how much we understand this technology and how much we enter into the Bitcoin ecosystem to defend it. Um, Nozomi, so yeah, I appreciated your speech about um, very much living in Orwellian times, um, you know, carrying our smartphone that's ever listening, mm -hmm. watching. Um, I work in technology, so I, I, I get uh -huh. the... Uh, mm -hmm. But unfortunately, I don't think our politicians really do get it, uh, and they're passing laws to monitor us. Um, 
So I'm wondering what we can do about the government passing these laws and do they just not understand what they're doing or are they doing it out of pressure from, say, the US government or, or what? For instance, if you look at the invention of the printing press, it, it, it distributed the ability, it enabled the ability for people to read the materials at the wider scale. And, and then later on, the uh, copyright industry came in to uh, restrict our access to information. And in the same way, I think that uh, free software like Bitcoin uh, would distribute the te technology. And the, that ensures uh, civil liberties, such as free speech and, and free association, for instance. Um, and you know, I think that the ethics of cypherpunks as I uh, mentioned briefly in my presentation, is that we do not uh, try to hold the politicians accountable because the, the government itself, when government is illegitimate, government itself does not represent us, then what's the point of going to the electoral arena and trying to hold the politicians accountable and ask them, please don't submit us, please you know, give us free speech. So um, instead of doing that, um, you know, cypherpunks showed us a new way, which is to build the alternative system. Uh, so the idea is if the government does not grant us privacy, if the government does not give us free speech, why can't we just create a technology what, that ensures free speech and then we could bypass the government? And if governments or elected official who wish to be part of our network, part of our community, then they can join us on, on our terms not on their terms. So I think that there is a tremendous possibility, as I, uh, as I see it, in the cypherpunk movement. And what we can do, as you know, I, for instance, is not a software coder, so I don't have a skill to develop uh, free software, but what I can do is perhaps I can fund, I can donate some money to uh, software developers to uh, represent me, to build uh, uh, surveillance free technology build a technology that really ensures free speech around the world. Uh, so these are the kind of things I think we can do. And uh, along with Bitcoin, uh, there is an uh, effort to create a decentralized internet, uh, which is called Made Safe. Uh, and basically what it does is, instead of us uh, using the encryption technology, for instance, using private key to communicate, uh, we would basically uh, uh, you know, create, uh, create a, a create a decentralized internet, then uh, we don't even have to encrypt anything. The encryption becomes a default. So these are the kind of, I think, the technologies that we need to develop. And, um, and in a sense that, you know, uh, governments are behind. You know, they, they cannot understand still what internet is, really. So uh, we can move forward with, uh, by innovating a better system. Um, three quick points. Um, if you don't have a virtual private network, then get one, um, because apart from, apart from uh, I don't know if, you, if any of you engage in the outrageous crime of downloading um, uh, illicit content, but um, I strongly discourage you from doing such a thing, but nonetheless you should have a virtual private network. The main benefit of that is that it encrypts your traffic uh, and it disguises uh, your location. Uh, which won't give you, in any sense of the word, complete protection or security from an intelligence agency wanting to see what you're doing. But it'll make it bloody expensive for them to do it. There's an economic issue here, which is that the more Australians use encryption technologies like VPNs to disguise their traffic, the more expensive it gets for intelligence and law exactly. enforcement agencies right. to monitor us. So drive the cost up. It makes life really difficult for agencies when people are using VPNs. They've got to try and get away. They've got to try and get a court order on the v on the VPN provider, or somehow decrypt, which is far more, far far more difficult. Um, but the content. So everyone should have a VPN. Currently, 16% of Australians have a VPN. I'd like to see that figure up to 30 or 40%, um, just because it's going to make life hell uh, for agencies. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to report my, my other two points, but yeah. Now, uh, second point. There's a very interesting debate going on in Australia at the moment in a very, very rarefied way. We have, compared to the United States and compared to the UK, uh, a pretty awful system of accountability for our intelligence agencies. And uh, at the moment, 
That accountability is provided by one parliamentary committee called the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. Uh, that committee has a very, very limited remit compared to the Senate and the House committees in the United States and the uh, Westminster, uh, the, the House of Commons committee in, uh, in Westminster. There's a politician by the name of Anthony Byrne, a very low-profile Labor politician from Victoria, who is pushing hard to significantly expand the remit of our intelligence committee so that they can initiate their own inquiries, because they can't do that at the moment, and that they have full oversight over all of the aspects of the additional powers that have been granted to intelligence agencies and law enforcement agencies uh, in, um, uh, in recent years. And it's an incredibly important debate because we are behind other countries in terms of our capacity to have any sort of oversight of our intelligence agencies and any push to expand that remit, I think, um, uh, deserves, uh, deserves very, very strong support. And it's a very, very arcane issue. It's not the sort of issue that, that is going to appeal to people as being you know, a magic solution to surveillance. It's not. But what it does do is, what it would do, is slightly restore the balance between our intelligence agencies, which just get so much money and so much power, and our parliament, which actually does have some people in it, like Nick Xenophon, like Scott Rodham, like Anthony Byrne, who are actually committed to exercising uh, some form of oversight. Third point, um, there's an interesting dynamic that's at work uh, in all this. I've been fascinated to watch someone like George Bramus, uh, our Attorney General, a, a, a man whom I have mostly contempt for, but nonetheless, a man who has gone from being a very strong supporter of civil rights when he was in opposition, a very strong opponent of data retention, a very strong skeptic of giving greater powers to our intelligence agencies, to when he became in, uh, our Attorney General in office, suddenly became a great enthusiast for those powers. Now, what happened? What was the process that went on in his head that transformed him from a civil rights advocate into a national security advocate? That fascinates me, and I think one of the things that we need to think about is less in terms of personalities and more in terms of systems. We have created a national security bureaucratic system in Australia and it is profoundly powerful. It is a system that is uh, seemingly designed to kind of relentlessly expand itself, to, uh, to give itself more power, to replicate itself. And uh, quite how that mechanism works, I don't know. Uh, but it's something that I've, I'm certainly going to do some work to try and investigate. Systems take on, in a way, personalities and character traits in a way that individuals do as well. Um, but they are far beyond the control of any particular individual, even one as powerful as an Attorney General. Um, you even look at Malcolm Turnbull. Malcolm Turnbull uh, strongly opposed data retention back in 2012, said some very harsh things about it. Now, of course, he presides over a government that has introduced it. So what, what is that process that has crystallised in the mind of Malcolm Turnbull, a person that everyone agrees is formidably intelligent, that he has gone, undergone that transformation? What's the, what's the systemic process that's happened there? I think we need to think more in terms of systems, uh, or at least think, uh, you know, think every bit as much in terms of systems as we do about individual politicians. Thank you very much, Nasomi and Bernard. I think uh, tonight was particularly enlightening uh, for most of us, including me. Um, uh, I'd like you to thank our two speakers uh, warmly. Well,